Hello, everyone. What's God's plan for saving all humanity? Did you realize that from Genesis through Revelation, his plan is revealed, actually, in various little stages, all the way from Genesis 1 till Revelation 22. God uniquely made man and woman in his image after his likeness. All the other animals and all life forms other than that were spoken into existence. I'll put the scriptures on the side, Psalm 33, verses 6 to 9. We are the only ones uh, with whom God actually got in the dirt and built the man and built the woman later on from the side of the man. And we're the only ones in whom he breathed the breath of life. Everybody else was just breathing, uh, just spoken into existence, everything else. But when Adam and Eve and all that, before I go on there, let me just say this. God also gave Adam and Eve uh, dominion, the end of Genesis 1, dominion over the earth. And uh, together, man and woman together were to rule the earth and have dominion and rulership. Uh, they, uh, so, so, but when Adam and Eve broke God's law um, and did not choose the tree of life, but decided to listen to somebody else, they essentially temporarily um, handed over to Satan the devil the keys to rulership world rulership, although still with ultimate controls and limits imposed by Jehovah, the Bible says Satan is a god of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The Bible says Yeshua actually said it a couple of times in John 14, his last night alive as a human being, he said, uh, even Yeshua said, the ruler of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. I think that's in John 14.30. And then also in John 12, I think it is, John 12, 31, uh, that the ruler of this world has been judged. But anyway, until his Yeshua returns as King of kings and Lord of lords, temporarily the rulership has been handed to Satan. Originally it was given to mankind to rule the earth. But at the seventh trump, there's seven trumpets leading to the return of, of Yeshua, at the seventh trump, at the last trump, we are changed. We're made immortal. We're changed to spirit beings. And that's the first time we see Yeshua in, uh, face to face. The, the elect angels gather us up, take us up to heaven. I mean, the heavenly clouds right here above us is what I meant to say. And uh, there's a saying in, or statement in Revelation 11:15, And then they heard, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So anyway, Adam and Eve sinned, handed the rulership temporarily. And in Genesis 3, 15, when uh, Jehovah comes and speaks to Satan and to Adam and Eve, Adam, Adam blamed Eve. I didn't ask for some woman. You gave me this woman. And Eve said, the serpent deceived me. The serpent didn't have any leg to stand on, so he just stood there or sat there. But Jehovah said to the serpent that the woman's seed, there will be enmity. He says, I'll put Genesis 3.15. I'll put enmity between your seed and my seed and the woman's seed. Your seed and the woman's seed. And your seed, he said, you will bruise his heel. You will bruise, or actually the Hebrew word there means crush. The woman's seed would crush Satan's head and he would crush or bruise the seed's heel. That's a prophecy for the crucifixion. But our ancestors all rejected God and were banished from the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. Garden of Eden means delights, pleasantness. And so all mankind who were inside Adam and Eve and their seed and egg were also cast out in that sense. And through one man, Romans 5.12 tells us, through one man death entered the world through sin to all mankind. But now in the woman's seed, in the woman's seed, Yeshua, Yeshua Christ, the Messiah, humanity can be brought back to God. And we'll explore this fully some other time. But remember, Christ's seed, what beget him, was not from the seed of Adam. But from Christ's father was God. Christ's father was God. So he was not part of this sin that entered and infected all humanity. Have you thought of that before? But anyway, strong implications there. We'll talk more about that, explore it. But God did not say when the woman's seed would come. So here's Satan. 
hearing that the woman's seed is going to crush my head, which is far worse than crushing someone's heel. So he was constantly looking to find out who that seed was going to be. Satan is not omniscient. He is not all-knowing as God is. He assumed it might be Abel because God accepted Abel's offering, but not, but not, um, not uh, Cain's. And so uh, he had Cain kill his brother Abel. He tried to kill various ones throughout history who might be the seed, uh, like David, King David. He, you know, he had Saul throwing javelins at him and chasing him and everything. Because at some point, Satan finds out that that seed is going to come through Judah, the Lion of Judah and all of that, the scepter and all of that. Then he tried later on in the days of Esther to wipe out the entire Jewish race. He unsuccessfully tried to kill Yeshua himself after his, soon after his birth, in a couple years or so after his birth. But Yeshua lived, who then gave himself a ransom for all. I feel like my mouth is mealy mouth tonight. <laughs> anyway, and he opened the door for us to receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Let's read that in Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, that's Adam, much more the, uh, those who receive the abundance of grace, of favor, abundance of it, and of the gift of righteousness. That's a gift we just don't hear enough about if we ever hear it in many of the Sabbath-keeping churches. The gift of God's own righteousness. Philippians 3, verse 9, 10, and 11, Paul says, I don't want my own righteousness from keeping the Torah. I want the righteousness that is a gift from God through faith in Yeshua. That's what he says in Philippians 3. I want that righteousness, not the best I can do, but the best God could do. So anyway, so Romans 5, 17, again, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. So the gift of his righteousness, we just don't talk about it. And gift is not something you earn, it's something you're given. But we have to receive these gifts, abundant uh, grace, and the gift of his very own righteousness. I have many sermons on God's righteousness. You can just type it into the search bar and you'll see them pop up. Sometimes they're blogs. Sometimes they're, they're the actual message, the sermon. And I hope you will uh, check out the blogs and the sermons, the video of sermons, the audio sermons, two different things. Sometimes I just record an audio. It's a lot less work, a lot faster to get up there, uh, posted. And sometimes I do a video. And then there are uh, blogs. We're going to try other things as we go along. Give us your suggestions, too. So welcome, anyway. Welcome to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields. I'm the host and founder of Light on the Rock. Make sure you do check out all the different videos and all of that. And do, do uh, comment. We have on the blogs, we have a one to five star grade. If you like the, the blog or the message, uh, I'd like to hear from you. If you have questions, I'd like to hear from you or comments. Anyway, God's Holy Days. Let's go back to the topic today, which is the overview of God's Holy Days. Now I'm going to give a quick overview from Passover through trumpets, or the Jews call it Rosh Hashanah, but let's call it Passover, all the way through Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, or Yom Teruah. We'll talk a lot about all of that today. So God tells us clearly what his plan of salvation actually is, and his plan is revealed through the harvest seasons of Israel through his seven holy days, which are based on various things being harvested. And these are not Jewish holidays, as they call it. These are my Moedim, my divine appointments. I expect you there, Yehovah says. Leviticus 23, 1 and 2, these are the feast of the Lord. These are the feast of Yehovah, not feast of the Jews. The early covenant church, the early new covenant church, uh, the New Testament actually started on one of these Moedim, uh, the Feast of Pentecost, Shavuot, which means weeks. It's also called Feast of Weeks because you count 50 days shortly after Passover. And so anyway, the early church kept Passover, kept the Days of Unleavened Bread, even in Corinth where it was a very, very Gentile, mostly Gentile congregation. I have divided these up into two big groups, the Spring Holy Days, the Spring Holy Days and the Fall Holy Days. Think of the spring holy days as being about 
early harvest called first fruits. Think of the spring holy days as mostly already being accomplished, uh, fulfilled. I say mostly because I'm going to say quite a bit today about Pentecost. I see Pentecost as a transition holy day that's been partly fulfilled, but still has a lot yet to be fulfilled as far as I can see it. And I'll explain that. Um, <clears throat> Christ was the first fruits, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. There, Paul says, God is going to be saving mankind, each one in his order. There are many of you who believe that now is the only time that we can possibly accept Yeshua or Jesus and be saved forever and ever. Uh, now is the day of salvation, right? Now is the only day of salvation, people say. If now is the only day of salvation and there's no other name by which you can be saved except the name of Yeshua, Jesus, Acts 4.12, Who's winning the battle? Who is winning the battle? And you know good and well that the majority of even people who claim to be Christian don't really live their religion. How many of them have really accepted Yeshua as their Lord and are obeying him and seeking him and live by him, live by his spirit, led by his spirit, God's spirit? I don't believe God's losing this battle. I believe God is calling some now and will call many and of those in the in the millennial time and then the end of or the yeah towards the end of Revelation 20 it talks about then the dead gave up their dead and there's a great resurrection and the Revelation 20 talks about a first resurrection which implies others to come and there will be others we'll talk about that in the next sermon and others so anyway after Yeshua and his sacrifice then the holy, you know, because his sacrifice was Passover, days of leavened bread, picture him, he's the bread, and picture then the Pentecost, and we'll, we'll get into more detail. Finally, we come to the final autumn of the year, the last four holy days, not holidays. These are holy days, sacred convocations, holy convocations. Don't call them holidays. I know Jews do. But in the month of Tishri, seventh month of the Hebrew calendar or God's calendar. By the way, remember September is sept used to be related to a seventh month as well, till they change things, and then oct means eight. You know, so um, but in God's seventh month is when they usually fall. Sometimes they overlap into October. Many keep the Moedim holy days, but seem to miss the point that they point to the fact that the holy days explains. What, that God calls people and groups in their order, as 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 25 explains. Go back and read that if you're not familiar with that. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 25. Then, um, so I'll go in depth in future, but if God has to reach everyone today, I think he's losing. He's not losing. Based on the false teaching that if anyone doesn't accept Christ, as a personal savior right now, they're burning hell forever, then God's losing, right? Did God, by the way, anywhere anywhere in the Bible say the wages of sin is eternal life in hell? That's what many churches teach, in essence. They say that kind of death in hell is separation from God. That's what death really means and all that. Go back and read Malachi. I think it's chapter 4. It might be chapter 3 that says the, the wicked will be as ashes under the feet of the righteous. Burnt up, not being tortured forever in a lake of fire that never uh, just goes on and on, just, you know. So I'm telling on authority of God's word, God is not trying to save everybody right now. The holy days explain it. It's all about timing. So let's get into it. Those being called now are called first fruits, first fruits of salvation. James 1.18, for now we are first fruits, it says, they're pictured in the spring holy days, which are also called first fruits holy days. I'll show you those verses in a minute. And then the first of the fall holy days, Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah in Hebrew means day of blasts. It's coming up right here in September. Trumpets, shouts. Teruah could be a blast of trumpets, shofars. It can be a shout. It can be a loud cry. It, could, it can be a feeling... Uh, fearful, crying out in fear, or it could be shouting in jubilation. 
Anyway, so I believe in our church services today, we should be shouting on this day of joy, praising God, shouting praises to the King of Kings and to God our Father. We should be blowing on shofar, which I meant to have here, but I didn't bring. So let's get started first with a high review of the spring holy days leading up to the fall. So in the fall, we have Yom Teruah, then we have the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, fasting, and then we have Feast of Tabernacles, and then we have the last great day, I mean, I'm sorry, the eighth day, the eighth day. I don't personally believe the last great day is the last day of a, the last great day is the last day of the feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. But the eighth day is, uh, is a very special day. And I believe the last holy day is called, in, it is called in the Bible, the eighth day, simply that. Exodus 12, verse 1 and 2, the Jews like to say that uh, the beginning of the year, the new year is Rosh Hashanah. Um, which is not what the Bible says. In Exodus 12, verses 1 and 2, Jehovah says to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month, which was Aviv, the, you know, Tel Aviv, that's the same kind of, you have the B and the V, and it's, you know, Tel means a hill. Uh, Tel Aviv is the same as Aviv, the month of Aviv. But anyway, this month shall be the beginning of months to you. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And in fact, if you read about uh, the uh, Feast of Trumpets or what the Jews call Rosh Hashanah, in Leviticus 23 it says, in the first day of the seventh month, that's hardly a new year, first day of the seventh month, all right? So going by what the Bible says and not, not rabbinic, Talmudic, Mishnah traditions, but what the Bible says, okay, that's our authority, not what man says they want to believe. So anyway, God calls the Feast of Blasts or Trumpets the first day of the Hebrew seventh month. In this year, in, in 2021, and the dates will change from year to year, but based on our Gregorian calendar every year, uh, here are the dates this year. Feast of Trumpets, so Yom, Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, uh, is September 7. Those who want to uh, see the sliver, remember that the, the new months, the new moons in Bible parlance, is not is not like the new moons we in the Western world follow with the dark of the moon. No, the new moon in Bible understanding is the first sliver of light. It's always been that way. The first sliver, not the end of last month's sliver. So beware of that. Then you have a dark period of a couple of days, and then you have the first sliver of light. And so this year. Those who want to observe and do observe the first sliver in Jerusalem are likely to keep it September 9 on Thursday, September 9. And then if we go on ahead to the Day of Atonement, those keeping the rabbinic Jewish calendar, it's September 16, 2021. Uh, those who will do by observation, if they're able to see the, the sliver, uh, when they think they will on the 9th, so let me spend a few minutes reviewing the spring holy days and wrapping up. So you got the dates this year, September 7. Some will do it on 9. That's for trumpets or Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah. And then September uh, 16 for Yom Kippur. Uh, those who observe the, the sliver of light might keep it either on the 17th or the 18th. They won't know until they do. In a nutshell, think of the spring holy days picturing events already that have occurred, for the most part. The spring holy days point to Christ's first coming, another way of looking at it, and right around that time, and his wedding to Israel, and his giving of the Holy Spirit. And then think of the fall holy days as what Yeshua has yet to do, likely, I hope, in our lifetime. So let's start with Passover. I have many sermons on Passover. You can look up When I See the Blood, you can look up just the word Passover, and lots of sermons will pop up. Uh, pictures God delivering Israel out of Egypt, the death of the firstborn of the Egyptians, and those who were under the blood of the Lamb. They put them up in, on their houses. They were passed over. Their firstborn didn't die. All of that points to Yeshua. So when we talk and have our Passover services 
and then the uh, the evening at the end of Passover day, and uh, many people come together and have a big meal and all of that. Rather than focus on Egypt and Pharaoh and coming out of Egypt, death of the firstborn, you can explain that, but keep saying if you do that, all of this points to Yeshua. All of it does. Because Yeshua said, remember, Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, do this in remembrance of me. And there's no record that in his entire Passover, final Passover with the disciples, that he ever talked about Egypt or Pharaoh or anything like that. <clears throat> when we take Passover, we must point to Christ. The lamb pointed to Christ. The firstborn pointed to, you know, he became our firstborn sacrifice for us. After that, after Passover day, the day that Yeshua was crucified at 3 p.m. on Passover day, that's when he died, we have the Days of Unleavened Bread. The first day and the last day of unleavened bread are holy days. When, when um, we're delivered by Christ out of sin, they started coming out of Egypt, and our lives need to move away from a life of sin, pictured by Egypt. And so we take in this unleavened bread, which is not picturing our righteousness, frankly, which has been the emphasis by some in the past, maybe, maybe even by me. The unleavened bread, as I see very clearly now, does not picture my goodness, but Yeshua's perfect goodness. Yeshua's perfect goodness. I take him into me every single day of the days of unleavened bread. He is now my life. He is now my bread. He is now my sustenance. He's the bread from heaven. So though we still stumble into sin, it's no longer a way of life as what days of unleavened bread show us. Yeshua is my life now. He is the unleavened bread of righteousness. Remember also that on three times in a year, the Bible does not say seven, but three times in a year we are to bring a holy day offering. At the days of unleavened bread, at Pentecost, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And so support the ministries where you're being fed. Support the ministries where you're being fed. And yes, we do accept we do accept Holy Day offerings to help pay for the work that we're doing and the, and the charities that we're working with. Uh, we're keeping 30 people alive, basically, in Kenya. Uh, most of, 28 of them are, are orphan children, and uh, we've been doing it now for many, many years. Now let's go to Deuteronomy 16, verses 16 and 17. I'll have it posted up here. Maybe it's been posted already three times a year. Uh, all the males should appear. Uh, later on, you find women certainly were there too. Feast of unleavened bread, the Feast of Weeks, Feast of Tabernacles, and don't come empty-handed, God says. So now the date varies from year to year, but there is, right soon after Passover, uh, the wave sheaf day, picturing Christ, his resurrection, being raised up to heaven. And I go ahead and, and do a, a web search on, on my, on my uh, Light on the Rock site. Light on the rock, go to Wave Sheaf, Wave, W A V E S H E A F, Wave Sheaf Day. Wave Sheaf is one word. That pictured Yeshua going back up to heaven to be accepted by the Father and really on behalf of all of us so that the rest of the barley harvest could continue. So it was a work day actually, but on this day Yeshua went up. I hope you hear my sermon on Wave Sheaf Day. He, in front of Father, petitioned that we be accepted on his behalf as we're now part of his body, his perfect, holy, righteous body, when we accept him as our, as our life, as our Savior. And so no matter how bad you've been, when we accept Yeshua, we become accepted by the Father because we're now part of Yeshua. And that's the righteousness that he sees. And will always see once I've accepted Yeshua and keep him as my Lord and Savior. It's not a holy day, but it's an important day to understand. And we count 50 days then to Pentecost, which means 50, and Shavuot means weeks. The Hebrew word is Shavuot. Weeks are seven weeks plus a day. And 
now we're transitioning into the rest of those who are being called in, in this time before Christ returns. I call it a transition day because so much has already happened on Pentecost. I have to spend time on it because there's some confusion between Pentecost and um, between Pentecost and the, the Feast of Trumpets and what happens, the resurrections and all that. So let's talk about that. What's happened already? Pentecost is called the Day of First Fruits. Keep that in mind. It's the Day of First Fruits. Put it on the screen, Numbers 28, 26. Of the first fruits of your wheat harvest. That's Exodus 34, 22. Pentecost was when Jehovah um, gave Israel the Torah, the law, the instructions at Mount Sinai from Exodus 20 onwards. Actually, Exodus 19 onwards. And then in the New Covenant, God poured out His Holy Spirit, the seal of His promise to complete what He started in Acts chapter 2. Day of Pentecost. God married Israel at Mount Sinai on the, at least the season of Pentecost. I think it was the day. Exodus 24, verses 3 to 11. It's very likely, very likely that Ruth and Boaz were married about this time because it says in Ruth 2.23, like we'll put it on the board so you can write it down, or you can go just print my notes too, that Ruth stayed with her mother-in-law Naomi through the barley and the wheat harvest. So that puts, you, that puts you then to Pentecost. On Pentecost, there were also two large, very large loaves about this big, about two feet long or so, very large leavened loaves. You can read that in Leviticus 23, 15 to 17. Remember, this is an overview. I'm not stopping. You can write these down, look them up later on. That were raised on high on Pentecost Day by the high priest towards heaven and then lowered again. Why were they raised up and brought back? What does all that mean? Scripture does not tell us why there were two, or what the two represented. A lot of speculation, uh, Jew and Gentile, Israel and Gentile, uh, Old Covenant, New Covenant, uh, those who've died in Christ, those who are uh, alive when he comes. The Bible simply doesn't tell us. What it does tell us, though, is what the loaves represented. Leviticus 23, verse 17, at the very end of the verse. Leviticus 23, verse 17. They, the loaves, the leavened loaves, are first fruits to Jehovah. Now the wave sheep was not leavened. This, these are loaves that are leavened. Now the thing about leavened loaves is that the leavening is no longer active. We're no longer sinning as way of life. We still stumble in sin. Yes, we do. But leavened loaves can't leaven anything else. The leavening action is done. Picturing sin. That should be done and over with. Hope you think about that. So Pentecost Shavuot is clearly about picturing people who are called first fruits. Numbers 28, 26, on the day of first fruits. Leviticus 23, 17, the end of it. These loaves are first fruits. That word first fruits is not used about the fall holy days. It's not. But we're not told why there are two loaves, so let's go on from there. Who are the first fruits? James 1.18 says we are. If we have God's Holy Spirit being led by God's Spirit, we are the first fruits. Revelation 14.4 says the 144,000 who are seen in heaven after the, after the resurrection are seen in heaven. These are first fruits redeemed from the earth. Redeemed. Revelation 14.4. Paul many times refers to specific individuals in Achaia or Rome or other places as being first fruits in this age. So the spring holy days are all about first fruits. Keep that in mind. And those being called to salvation now, but not, but not the fall holy days. The first resurrection. I have a sermon or blog about the first resurrection, a blog rather, being changed to a spirit being. Paul says clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, that there are, there's a fleshly body and there's a spiritual body, a spirit body. And so go read my blog about what kind of body will we have. It's all in there. And um, Pentecost is actually called the Day of First Fruits. 
Feast of Trumpets is not called anything about being first fruits. The Feast of Trumpets in the fall is not. Pentecost is. So many of us are coming to believe more and more over the past few years that the seventh trump will actually sound on Pentecost, not trumpets, because it's about, the seventh trumpet is about resurrecting and changing the saints, the children of God, those who are called first fruits. First fruits belong to the spring. The language, the terminology, everything is about the spring. It's not about the fall. And so I believe very strongly that the first resurrection occurs on Pentecost. Pentecost was also all about marriage between God and Israel, Exodus 24. Uh, Pentecost is when God gave the seal of his uh, uh, promise to, to marry uh, the, uh, the church, the, uh, the ecclesia. Remember Ephesians 5 says, We are the bride of Christ. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved, loves the church and gave himself for it. Okay? It's the Israel of God, the spiritual Israel, if you will. The Israel of God is the language the Bible uses, whom God, whom Christ will marry. I hope you're keeping up, following. So he'll marry his bride, the church, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. I have, I have betrothed you as a chaste virgin to Christ, uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, 2. So I believe the marriage happens on or right around Pentecost. I think the resurrection happens then. I think people look at the word trumpets and then they equate instantly that, okay, there's seven trumpets, so it must be feast of trumpets and all this happens. Remember, shofars and trumpets are blown every single every single holy day, Numbers 10. So I have sermons on the website about the wedding of the Lamb, the Pentecost. I go prepare a place for you. Just search engine them on the, on the website. You'll see them. Again, why do I think the resurrection takes place on Pentecost? And that's why I call it a transition day because so much has happened already on Pentecost. But if I'm right, then the resurrection has yet to occur on Pentecost. The wedding of the Lamb to his church. To his church on Pentecost. That's what the Bible says. Ephesians 5, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. And after you blow the seventh trumpet, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Right? That's Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, I believe. Then what happens? There are several inset chapters in Revelation. But what happens after the seventh trumpet is that there are seven last plagues. Seven last bowl plagues, all listed in Revelation 16. I recommend you read that. Scare the daylights out of you if you're not close to God. But anyway, to fulfill the seven last bowl plagues surely has to take three, three and a half months or four months. Surely it includes bringing over 200 million people from the East. That's where China comes in. Probably India, Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan. People from the East all coming together to fight this. Uh, they'd seen Yeshua come already earlier in the clouds and the bride taken up to him, the elect. Then they disappeared, went to heaven, as I see it. And then he comes back, Revelation 19 says, on a, on a white charger, an angelic white charger. A, a flesh and blood charger is not going to survive that. So I'm sure those are angels that look like horses. So if the resurrection were to happen on trumpet, what are we doing after we're changed to spirit up there with Christ? Seven bowl plagues have to go through yet. The armies have to come in. 200 million have to come from the east all the way to Israel. That's going to take time. What are we doing? I don't think we're just hovering, waiting for all that to happen and finally come and land on the Mount of Olives. I say that he takes his bride to heaven to heaven to get married, just as Isaac did, as Isaac was a type of Christ, took Rebekah into his mother's tent to consummate the marriage and to be married. Uh, to, let's put that in, to be married and consummate the marriage. Galatians 4, 21 to 26 equates or compares Sarah's tent that Isaac took Rebekah in to heaven. Go back and read that. You go back and read that. Yeshua, the firstborn son of God from among many brethren, has to marry a bride, by the way, 
who is of the same type as he is, kind after kind, reproduces after kind. He will marry others who are also true children of God as one body in him, with one body. He's got to be the same kind. We'll talk more about that. If you want to understand what I'm saying here, go look up the word breathtaking. Just type in breathtaking, our breathtaking destiny. And there are three sermons I gave on explaining exactly what I mean by Christ has to marry someone just like him. Anyway, so the spring days and Pentecost picture, the first fruits. We are the first fruits. The fall holy days pictures the rest of the harvest, the big harvest, when everything's being brought in. It's called the Feast of Ingathering. That's when all the olives and the vegetables and the fruits and everything else is being brought in. They're not the first fruits. The first fruits are, are called first fruits in the spring. Holy days have to match the picture that they're being given. The ones marrying Yeshua will be first fruits. First fruits belongs to the spring. That's why I say it's Pentecost, among other things. Now we, so now we move on to Yom Teruah, commonly called Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, but the Bible verbiage is Yom Teruah. Yom means day. Teruah, I'll put it, uh, uh, I think I have it in here. Maybe have it later in here. But anyway, Teruah, in, according to the uh, uh, dictionary of uh, Old Testament words that I have, means shout, means blast, like from a shofar or trumpet. It means cry. It means noise. Okay. So the short story is that this day represents Yeshua returning. He's now been married. He's returning with his already resurrected saints. That happened on Pentecost. They into heaven got married as spirit beings in heaven. And now he's returning with spirit being elect and saints and holy angels to rout the armies that have gathered in Israel to fight him. 200 million, the Bible says someplace. 200 million. And they gather in Megiddo, northern Israel, all the way down to Jerusalem itself, about 170 miles or so. I think that's what it is. So he comes back to earth, I believe, on this day. I also believe it's going to be very hard to tell which day it is at about this time. There's going to be so much smoke in the, in the, in the air from fires, from wars, from uh, volcanic eruptions. Uh, plus the fifth bowl plague, I believe, is darkness, complete darkness in the land of the beast power. It's Revelation 16, the, the, about the middle towards the end of it. Complete darkness. So if you're trying to find a sliver of moonlight so you know what day is the Feast of Trumpets or Yom Teruah, you're not going to be able to see it. The sun and the moon shall not give their light because they're covered by clouds and darkness and gloominess. That's what it says. Add to that all the EMP strikes and all the uh, technological attacks, uh, uh, cyber warfare, everything else. I don't know if your watches will work, if your cell phones will work, if anything electronic will work. I suspect many people won't even know what day it is from week to week in the last few weeks before Yeshua returns. Anyway, now more detail. It is possible, the Jews believe, that on this day, Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, they call it, which is wrong, that this was the day Adam and Eve were created. Some believe this was the day that Yeshua was born. Not in December. We know absolutely it wasn't December. Jews keep this day as two days to be sure they got the right day. And so they'll be keeping it Monday night, September 6, 2021, through Wednesday night. And on this day, what do Jews do? They, they have festive meals. It's New Year resolutions. They blow the, 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 the shofar in their synagogues up to 100 times. And, um, and they light candles each evening. They have big feast, happy time. All right, so that's what the Jews do. And that's what their traditions say to do. But believe it or not, among all the seven holy days, Yom Teruah has the least said about it specifically. The least. So let's backtrack again and wrap it up to this day. In a nutshell, we're changed to spirit. We're resurrected to spirit on Feast of Trumpets, I believe, not Feast of Trumpets. 
We're resurrected on the Feast of Pentecost, is what I'm supposed to have said. Resurrected the Spirit on the Feast of Pentecost. To meet Christ in the clouds of our earthly heaven, and then we're taking the heavenly Jerusalem get married. As spirit beings. It's all happening as spirit beings. And all those who will be in the first resurrection will include Abel, all the way to the last people God gives the spirit to at the very end. Again, remember, shofars and silver trumpets were blown, blown on all the holy days. The seven last bowl plagues are being poured out while we're in heaven. In the meantime, um, and that's, I'll just read to you the last couple of bowl plagues here in uh, Revelation 16. Remember the seventh angel sounded, and, and that's when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God, of our Christ. Um, but then after that, there are seven bowl plagues, okay? There's seven seals. The seventh seal, then you go into seven trumpets. The seventh trumpet, return of Christ, Revelation 11:15 says. And then at the end of the seven trumpets, you have seven last plagues. Okay, seals, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven last plagues. Now we're reading some of the last couple plagues. Revelation 16, verses 20 to 21. And then the sixth angel, who had the bowl of plagues, poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For these are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth, and of the whole world to gather them to battle at that great day of God Almighty. Do you understand what's going on here? The sixth seal, I mean, I'm sorry, the sixth bowl plague dries up Euphrates to open the way for 200 million, it says in another place, to come and cross that and go to Israel. And it's going to involve people from the east primarily but all the kings of the earth will be involved to some degree. We're given the warning that he comes as a thief. You won't know exactly. So be ready. Keep your garments of righteousness that he gives us ready. Verse 16. And they gathered them together to a place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Har Megiddo. Valley of Megiddo. So the sixth seal is bringing over the great armies. The, se the seventh seal. Are you ready for this? You sure you want me to read this? Terrifying times, unless you know your God. We're all praying thy kingdom come. I wrote this to my sister recently. We all pray thy kingdom come, but then as things get worse and worse and worse and worse, we don't like it, but we know from Scripture that what we're going to see are the worst times the world's ever seen. Ever seen. Just before Yeshua returns. If he didn't come, we, there'd be no life saved alive, we're told. Anyway, Revelation 16, 17, then the seventh angel poured out his bowl, his plague, into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. It's finished. And there were noises, thunderings, and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. It's going to be the biggest earthquake this planet has ever seen. And from you, if you keep on reading, it sounds like this earthquake is going to be worldwide. It's going to go all the way up and down and through, and all those um, uh, platelets, uh, plates, you know, where the where the different, uh, not platelets, but the the earth plates that come together all around Japan and the Philippines and around South America and so on, that are earthquake prone. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. Okay, great mighty earthquake such as uh, never never been since great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake, verse 18, as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell of the nations. So it's a worldwide earthquake. Great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So Babylon got it too. Babylon meaning, uh, that's a code word for a big city that rules the earth, as you'll see. And then every island fled away. I don't know if you want to be on islands at this time. And the mountains were not found. 
And this is a huge earthquake, leveling mountains, making islands disappear. Great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone weighing somewhere between 75 and 100 pounds. Men blasphemed God because of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Are you reading what I'm reading? So by the time that's happened, we'll have been married to Yeshua. We're up in heaven. We're spirit. We've had the wedding supper. Now as spirit, we get on our angelic steeds, come back with our husband, our savior, come back and face this mess that's brewing on earth. Earth is in shambles at this time. And anyway, um, I believe the return happens on the Feast of Trumpets. I can't prove it, but I believe it does. So by this time, the skies will be very, very dark, hard to see anything. The fifth plague in Revelation 16 is total darkness. So we come back, I believe, on trumpets. The Mount of Olives, now you want to read Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, let's put that up there. Zechariah 14, verses 12 and 13. You should read the whole chapter of Zechariah 14 yourselves. Refresh your minds with it. That's what happens just before and after Christ returns. Zechariah 14. There will be great shouts of joy from us on our part to finally rid this world of leaders dominated by Satan and demons, as I've read, and start the new millennial reign of Yeshua and his bride on earth. Now again, if the resurrection is on the Feast of Trumpets, what do we do all the time when the seven bowls are being poured out after the resurrection, which happens on the seventh trumpet? I think the resurrection has to be Pentecost, okay? Now Leviticus 23, verse 23, 24. Then Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, not the first month, this is not a new year. God says it's not a new year. It's the seventh month. I go with what God says. On the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial, remembrance of blowing of trumpets. That, that, there, there, there's your teruah there. Blast, shouts, trumpets, shofar blasts. And uh, the complete word study says that the word teruah means, I'm quoting here now, it'll be in my notes, it's a feminine noun indicating sh shouts of joy. Shouts, a shout of alarm, a battle cry, refers to a loud, sharp shout, or cry in general. But it also can indicate a shout of joy or victory. Shout of, well, let's post this, Scott. Uh, like First Samuel 4, when the ark was brought into the camp, there was a great shout, and a great shout anticipating a coming event. That would be like, I believe Joshua 6 is about the uh, Jericho. And they're being told when, when you, at the seventh time you go around and we blow on the shofars, give a great shout, a great teruah. Can we refer to the noise or signal put out by an instrument, like a shofar, like a, like a trumpet, and so on. You can read the rest. Why the shouts? Well, because we're happy, we're joyful. If you've not ever been to a great baseball or football game, and when there's a great uh, score, a great, uh, uh, a great inning, or a great uh, in football, if they, a fantastic touchdown, People stand up, they shout, they hallelujah, they don't hallelujah, but they raise their hands, they wave, they do the wave. But somehow when it comes to religious things, we can't raise our hands in praise or pray in praise like the Bible says over and over and over that we should. Look up my uh, sermon on lifting up holy hands or holy arms in prayer, holy hands, I think. Lifting up. Just type in lifting up and see if that pops up. If you don't lift your hands up in prayer and are reluctant to do so, but you probably would do that at a ball game or whatever, or fantastic news, think where you're putting your priorities. Okay, Leviticus 23, 24, in the seventh month, the first of the month, is to be for you a day of complete rest, for remembering, this is complete Jewish Bible, a holy convocation announced with blast on the shofar, now, Jews use Rosh Hashanah as the first of ten days of awe. It's not in the Bible. 
That's their tradition. And it ends with atonement, the tenth day, which is judgment. So they, the Orthodox Jews are using this time. That's not a bad idea to fast, to repent, not, not to fast on trumpets, but, but to seek God, to uh, clean up your act, ask for mercy. Um, there are reasons why they have that tradition. It's not in the Bible. But just be aware of the days of awe, 10 days of awe. Okay, that's, that's a Jewish concept. So anyway, the rest of the fall holy days that come up, atonement, and then Feast of Tabernacles for seven days, and then the eighth day right after the seven days, uh, show what God is going to do after Yeshua returns. We'll talk about that next time. God is going to shake the world up more and more and more up until he, he returns through Christ. It's going to shake the earth until nothing more can be shaken. Wake us all up. We certainly do want to be right with God. Close to God, seeking God as never before. It's a day of blast. A day of shouting for joy. It's a day of showing some excitement for Christ, finally coming to rule for real. I'm 68, so I'm hoping he comes in my lifetime. The Bible says it's appointed men uh, about 70 years. And um, what's the wording there? It's not, it doesn't say if he's lucky he'll get 80, but something about 80 is in there too. It's in the book of Psalms. I'm 68, coming up to 70. So I'm hoping that before I'm 80, uh, I'm hoping Yeshua will be here by then. Uh, if he doesn't, then so be it. Whatever his, his will is and God's will is, so be it. And I'll be happy whenever he comes. Uh, for the rest of the world, though, the return of the Son of God is going to be a very, very tough time, a rough time. He's coming with power and authority, and he's coming to punish those who have destroyed the earth. And he's going to show his wrath and his judgment on all those who have hurt his people. Scripture refers to one year period before Christ returns to the Mount of Olives as the day of the Lord, not a Sunday. The day of the Lord is the time, the one year period leading up to the time Yeshua actually lands on the Mount of Olives. It's not going to be pleasant that one year time. Amos 5, verse 18, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. It will be darkness and not light. <clears throat> okay, this is a shofar. This is a ram's horn. And uh, this is a small ram's horn. But anyway, so you get an idea of what they look like. And that's what people typically think of as a shofar. But also, the, uh, I found out later that the, um, the oryx and the kudu are actually mentioned. And uh, this is a kudu horn, if I can... It's quite large. That's the base of it that goes to the, attaches to the skull. And uh, so I'll blow on both because on this day are a lot of, uh, a lot of shofar blowing going on. And it's a day of blast. Uh, these were what, uh, one of these two were what the uh, Israelites used going around Joshua. I'm not a very good one on the little one, but I'll try. That's that one. And then uh, this one here, surprised myself I could blow on it. This one here, the kudu horn's quite long. All right, day of blast. So to some people, it'll be a terrible time of plagues, darkness, earthquakes, war and hail. And others, God's children, it'll be a time of shouts of jubilation, victory. And in time, when, after Christ returns, things will get back to a beautiful kingdom again. Father in heaven, we just ask you in Yeshua's name, we just ask you, please, send Yeshua back. Send Yeshua back soon. Father in heaven, your kingdom come and your will be done right here on earth as it's being done up in heaven. Right now, there are a lot of things being done here that are not according to your way of life. So we're praying you'll speed things up and that we can learn to be jubilant about you and your way and 
shout for joy about this holy day Rosh Hashanah that the Jews call Rosh Hashanah that should be called Yom Teruah, the day of blasts. That's the, that's the wording you gave us, the day of blasts, the day of shouts of jubilation. The Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Blasts, may it come soon. Watch over your people, and I just pray now in Yeshua's name that you will pour down your Holy Spirit on all that you're calling now. Bring them to you. Bring many to you, Father, please, as many as you will. Put a special protection around all of your children all around the world. Many, so many are getting this COVID or the Delta variant or other variants. Just command from heaven that your children will not be affected by that. And Father, I ask you to do that, to put your divine protection on all those who are hearing this and many more. We ask you to bless the holy days coming up. Give us safe travel. Keep us safe from the COVID. And please pour out your Holy Spirit. Shine upon us with delight as we look up and praise you with jubilation and joy. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.